Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, full name Christian Gold, um, and welcome to the kickoff to what I what intends to be a series of yeah, short um, tutorials. Um, and uh, what I want to build is actually a data science product uh, using Python. And uh, the idea is to build a transcription tool um, so that you, whenever you have an audio file with, let's say, a conversation between people, that you um, can use speech to text to get a transcription of that audio conversation. And um, yeah, how will we do that? So some months ago, OpenAI um, did release their speech to text model, Whisper. And this is, uh, I played around with it and found it's working pretty nicely. And so that's why I wanted to use it. Um, but the problem is if you, for example, have a podcast um, with a dialogue of people, then you basically will just get one huge text and um, nothing of the model will tell you who is speaking when. So you basically just get one large text without any breaks, um, even if people switch in the conversation. So not very convenient to read for a dialogue uh, or even like multi-person setup. And um, I found another tool, it's called PeerNot. And um, this tool um, does speaker diarization, So what that tool does is it identifies in an audio file when is which person speaking. And so, yeah, kind of if you just combine both, then you know who is speaking when, and also you get the text from the Whisper module. And so hopefully we should be um, able to come up with a good solution of transcription of audio conversations. Why do I want to do that? Well, I for myself actually love podcasts. And um, whenever I stumble upon a pretty nice podcast, then I would love to have it in text form as well. So that I can highlight my main um, passages. And um, you could obviously also use this then eventually for other applications. For example, I shared it already with a friend of mine. He's working in a journalistic setup. And uh, whenever he does an interview, he sets up his recording machine. And in the end, he has this large audio file. And it's just much easier if you already have the text transcript because you kind of need to refine it before you actually publish it. Um, tweak it a bit, so that's just how it's done. Um, okay, but uh, you might also come up with several other use cases. So that's kind of the product that we want to have. Hopefully you also kind of like the product. But um, also why I'm recording it, um, because I think it's um, basically certain components in a data science project usually tend to be a bit underrepresented. So I mean, most of the buzz is always around, um, you know, the model itself, how many hidden, hidden layers, how do you train it and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, from my experience, um, if you really do this in an industry setup, then um, there's a huge um, pile of work also besides just the model itself. And um, that's kind of yeah, what I also want to um, put some light on here. And um, also like um, maybe some words to my background. So I did my PhD or kind of the doctor title, uh, what it's called here, um, in uh, statistics in what feels like ages ago. Um, and um, then I was also like working at university um, teaching uh, students and um, also taught some software um, introduction courses. Let's put it that way. But um, kind of what I have the feeling is like most of the times what you share then eventually is a bit more like this refined already final version of your software code. And what I have the feeling gets a bit, um, yeah, kind of what we miss out on is all these iteration steps that you have in between. Like you first start um, drafting a very, you know, just a sequence of commands. Then you need to think about what do you put in certain functions? How do you create the API for the function calls? Like, should this be an input or not? Uh, should it be uh, like a default input and uh, all that stuff? Um, but also like generally refactoring like certain variables that you um, kind of uh, come up with during development, like do you identify them as being actually parameters of a 
bigger configuration file or so and then you move it to a config file and how do you structure your code and um, the folder structure model versus source code and all that stuff so i think that's also pretty important it usually um, you just see the final version and uh, don't um, get kind of the thought process um, behind why would you actually do it this way or that way um, so that's something that i want to share here because i hope it helps in particular people that are rather at the beginning of their software engineering life or data science life. Um, and also, um, I think it's nice if you see certain tools a bit of in action. I mean, you don't use like um, notepad text editors or whatever um, as your only tool anymore. I mean, there are a couple of super awesome tools. Um, my currently favorite IDE is Visual Studio Code. You can see how I use it and also some of the helpful extensions that um, I installed and that I think are pretty worthwhile. Then we can also start our project from a project template from Cookie Cutter. Is, uh, that's what you will see, maybe a helpful tool for you as well. And then um, whenever it's about you know software best practices, then there are a lot of tools um, that you should be aware of. Most important, probably just Git, so version control. And then, yeah, some unit testing frameworks. You have it uh, more or less in every language. Um, here we are using Python. Um, then continuous integration, so um, GitHub Actions. So that means um, whenever you do changes on your code, kind of you want to automatically in the cloud run some tests to see whether you accidentally did break some components of your code base. And eventually um, we'll probably make a Python package out of the code, like not that I intend to upload it on, on a pip, but um, I think generally um, I want to have it for myself in a structure that I could rather easily reinstall it somewhere else. Um, once you have a code base, now the question is, or even a data science product, now the question is, what do you intend to make out of it? And if you just say, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's worthwhile sharing, but at least for me and my, like for myself, it's a handy tool, um, then you need to think about how can you easily trigger that tool on your machine. So uh, one way to do it, in particular, if you're a Linux user, would be a command line tool uh, where you, so that's an interface that I want to put on top of the, the um, tool itself so that you can, from command line, trigger the tool with certain options and you get also help message um, telling you which options are actually required if you <coughs> kind of don't use the tool for five years and then come back to it then um, you just need to um, find out what's the correct entry point again and um, so one framework that we are using here is python click Another option would be obviously slightly nicer than to come up with some form of a GUI front end. Um, a very cheap one to build here would be Gradio. So it's pretty awesome package to easily get some interface. Um, might be better than for Windows or whatever, or people who generally love to have GUI front ends. Um, but in all of that, what we talked about now, if, if you want to share it with someone else, then someone else also needs to install all your code and all the code requirements on their end. And that's actually a bit of a hassle because like um, we can obviously share the code. We can also easily tell which Python packages we use, but we will also um, make use of operating system libraries. For example, if you deal with audio files, the um, famous library FFmpeg, I think it's called, um, which needs to be installed so that your Python code on top of it will actually run so that you can manipulate mp3 files or uh, .wav files. Um, and uh, kind of then you could realize that like replicating your full uh, computing environment somewhere else can actually become somewhat painful because you first need to install all the system libraries, then the Python packages, fix the Python version, all that stuff. Okay, so um, we'll think about what it would mean to share our application. 
either with other people, but also kind of with ourselves, but kind of moving from laptop environment to the cloud and running it on a different machine in the cloud. So you also need to rebuild um, your computing environment there. So um, therefore we can look into Docker containers. Um, so small virtual environments that we can deploy into the cloud. A different um, way would be sharing our code through Hugging Face space. So Hugging Face is a very awesome yeah, machine learning um, environment, community, um, internet page. And uh, there you can build um, spaces and a space means also there's a virtual machine. It gets set up with the configurations that you intend it to have. So it installs the system libraries and then the code and all that stuff. So that other people actually could use your model or your product in the web browser without installing anything. And that's if you want to share it, obviously nice. Problem here will be um, the um, if you have a one hour podcast, actually the inference like applying the model to the one hour podcast will actually take pretty long and someone needs to pay for that computing time. And if it's your hugging face space, then um, either you need to pay or hugging face is willing to pay, but only if it's um, yeah, not taking too much computing time, which will not work in this setup. Different way it would be a Google Colab. So kind of you put just the high level function calls into a Jupyter notebook or a Google Colab notebook then and share the link and people can in their Google Cloud also like um, run your notebook. Like the first cells then would be just um, install first everything that is required um, to run the code. And um, yeah, then they could run it and um, yeah, you will usually get some computing time for free in the Google Cloud, so that might be an option. Um, okay, now we already thought pretty far about kind of what we eventually could do with it. One step further, we might also brainstorm a bit about um, how would you actually make a product out of it. So we don't want to just share it with other people for free, but somehow monetize what we are doing here. and. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, um, you could come up with like your own web page and uh, you have your own login system and clients need to register with an email address and then make an account and you need to store the password credentials and you have kind of this um, console or like every user has their own like um, login environment or cockpit sometimes called. Um, where they see their account credentials or like their account settings and they then have their podcast stored in there or whatever. Um, but uh, as you can already probably infer from how I described it, I mean, that's pretty much of an effort. We are definitely not doing it uh, in full here, um, but at least maybe brainstorm about it. Okay, so um, I hope you are kind of excited about that. Uh, give it a try. Um, also, my always recommendation, try to speed the videos up a bit. Uh, I'm not a native English speaker. I'm sometimes a bit slow with my sentences, so um, give it um, slightly faster um, watching speed. And um, yeah, then whenever you have questions, reach out and uh, have fun with it. See you.